Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in a time that is full of many questions, many uncertainties, but we do know things that are certain. Lord, we know the promises that you have made to us will be kept. Lord, we know that you have tomorrow taken care of. Lord, you tell us to take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Lord, I pray that we would trust you in that, that we would cast our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, um, on Sunday mornings, we're preaching and teaching through the Gospel of John. We interrupted that um, with our Resurrection Sunday. And my, the plan is, in my heart now, unless the Lord does something different, but uh, we're gonna, we'll pick up Sunday morning. Uh, we're moving, we finish chapter 7 and move into chapter 8 of John, the Gospel of John. Sunday evening we were, and still are, except it's just kind of put on pause, uh, teaching through First John. So we've got the Gospel and the first letter of John. And uh, we're, I know where we are, we're right, we just finished up chapter 2 and we're right, chapter 3, those first three verses of chapter 3 of First John are just wonderful verses. I've thought about shifting that over to Wednesday night and I don't know if I eventually will or not. But right now, my heart can only find uh, peace in just leaving this hour uh, open. And so, and, and uh, just give myself freedom to look at things that God brings to my heart that might be an encouragement to you. So that's what we're going to do tonight. I uh, appreciate we have a study sheet again. We'll try to get those for you. And so, uh, if you, you have that, you can follow along. And... Uh, you know, I've said several times, or a lot, a lot, uh, 
that when I'm having difficulties, you know, uh, being encouraged and it seems like problems are pressing in on me, one of the things I do is I go to one of the passages of Scripture, like Ephesians 1, that are just wide. I mean, they're just deep and wide and panoramic and show God's big picture. And that is so encouraging just to read it like Ephesians 1. And we're going to look at a couple other pastors, uh, passages uh, that are that way. And the Bible's full of them. And, you know, it's just kind of like backing out of the world. You know, you, you know you've seen those where, you know, you're, you're on the ground here on the earth. And then, you know, you get higher and higher into the atmosphere and the world. You know, eventually you're, and the world becomes small. And when you look at the big expansive pictures of God's providence and purpose, it helps you get a perspective of your own and has a unique way of encouraging you. So that's kind of what we're going to do tonight. I've entitled this, Where is All This Going? <laughs> Where is All of This Going? A Christian Perspective of History. And I, I had uh, the first passage that came to my mind was Romans 11 and then also 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, especially after the resurrection. We, we, we always touch on uh, chapter 15 during the resurrection time, Easter time, about the resurrection of the body and the gospel. But there's some verses later on that we talked about the ascension, but what the ascension means to history, and the resurrection means to history. So we're gonna, you can get those passages ready. Now, an American self-help writer, lay minister, or counselor uh, Hugh Prather uh, is most famous for his first book, Notes to Myself. And it was first published in 1970. And um, from the book, he said the following, My anxiety doesn't come from thinking about the future, but wa from wanting to control it. And uh, man, when I read that, I thought, uh, that is, we're all future tense, you know, and we all like to be in control and have all the, you know, the answers. And when we don't, we get, and we can't control it, well, then there's anxiety. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of anxiety concerning what lies ahead uh, in immediate context of day to day with this uh, uh, COVID-19. But beyond that, what lies ahead uh, each of us as citizens of this great nation. And uh, what are our concerns? Well, let me just list a few. These are, you could be listed, these are reasons to be anxious. I'm really trying to encourage you tonight. Here's one, the increasing growth and dependence upon government. Um, in Genesis, God sent Joseph ahead to Egypt. And he, he sent him ahead to preserve his family really what was a fledgling nation, nation, through a horrible famine. And so, you know the story, and you know the account, rising to the top of governmental leadership in Egypt, Joseph sets in motion a plan, a seven-year plan to, to store grain and then provide relief for everyone during the coming famine. And we must take note that that was God's plan. It wasn't Joseph's plan. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even revealed to Joseph. It was revealed initially to Pharaoh through dreams. So over time, both the Egyptians and Joseph's family were kept alive. You know, well, that's good. That is good. But in the process, if you know that account, Everyone ended up surrendering their possessions, their houses, their land, their children, and then themselves to Pharaoh. I mean, Pharaoh's governmental power and control in Egypt and the world grew and prospered through the famine. So Pharaoh profited through the famine. He, yes, he provided, but... He, his reign, his government, his reach grew as well. And the Israelites ultimately became slaves to Pharaoh and his huge, powerful 
government, and eventually they began to suffer and begin in need to be delivered by God. So th this pandemic has opened the door for government's growth, a greater role in our lives, and along with its intrusion, it, it, with, with its growth is its intrusion into our lives. We always know there's always overreach. And so there's a rule, and I, um, Dennis Prager, who I listened to, once, told, once said this, it stuck with me, as a rule, the bigger the government, the smaller the citizen. And then he said this, the bigger the government, the smaller the God. So, you know, we look to the Lord. Now, can the Lord use government to meet our needs? Well, absolutely. You know, uh, Romans 13, and of course, the account of Joseph. But at the same time, it's also an opportunity for other things. So here's the second thing, the loss of personal liberty and privacy. Uh, as Christians, we view our personal freedom, we view our liberty as granted to us by God, not government. And it seems with each new crisis we face, whether it's terrorism or school shooting or security issues, now a pandemic, inevitably the fix or the solution comes with a new invasion of our privacy or surrendering some of our personal rights, um, the right for free speech. And, and by the way, that's shrinking in America, the right to bear arms, and can I even say the right to assemble? Here's the third thing, the rising national debt, our national debts, the sum total of all outstanding debt owed by the federal government. And before the shutdown of our economy, uh, by this pandemic, our national debt was already astronomical and threatening our future. And on April the 7th, 2020, uh, this uh, last April, this April, our national debt exceeded $24 trillion, which will have a lasting, lasting implication in our future. Another thing is globalization. Uh, this pandemic has underscored the fact that our world is more interconnected and interdependent than ever before. Uh, the problems we, that face humanity, I mean, with, with the increase of population in this, in this world, and more and more require global solutions, which at the very least demands cooperation uh, among the family of nations and their leaders. And like it or not, we have entered an era, and we're not going back, but where nations are surrendering their sovereignty to a global government to, ad to address global concerns. Now, this has biblical, eschatological implications. And if you know the, your, the biblical teaching of the end times, then it looks like we're pretty much on, uh, you know, on our way. Nationalism is largely looked upon with disdain in our world. And, uh, and so globalization. And then fifth, our divided nation and the growing division and the strife between political parties, conservatives, progressives, it's destroying our nation. And if you know your Bible, you know the words of Jesus. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And, and that could be a family home. It could be anything. Even a nation. So divided we, we uh, fall. United we stand. And so these are things that we look past. Now, all of this and more increases our concern about our future as well as the future of our children and the future of our grandchildren. I just read, I'm in the Old Testament, and, and um, Hezekiah had his life extended 15 years, which I don't know was a good idea or not, but <laughs> he begged God, and God gave him 15 years. And somewhere along there, the, he had some emissaries from Babylon come visit him and get well kind of a visit, I guess. 
And uh, Hezekiah just showed them the whole house. He showed them all the treasures. And then after that happened, he was rebuked by the prophet saying, what did you do? And he said, well, don't you, I tell you, won't you know, everything you showed the Babylonians, uh, they're going to come and take one day. And that was a prophetic uh, word that was fulfilled. And I never forget how Hezekiah, what he said after that. He says, well, you know, he said, well, they told him, he said, well, they're not going to come until after you're gone. And Hezekiah says, Whew, long as that I'm not here, you know, who cares about my children and my grandchildren? Well, I tell you what, these implications of all of this affects our grandchildren and our children. And so often our concerns over our nation and its direction in, in increases because we feel that we're powerless to do anything about it. And while we must never minimize the power and the influence of just one person, we must realize at the same time that as Christians, we know and serve a sovereign God who is in control of this world and of history. So that brings me to Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, Paul communicates God's far-reaching plan and purpose, which includes Israel. So it's, it's a big chapter. We're not going to... And so in this chapter, God pictures His eternal plan as an olive tree. His eternal plan and purpose as an olive tree. He, you know, if you read this, He focuses on its roots. He moves up to its trunk, and then He talks about the limbs of this tree. And what we know is that God's redemptive plan is centered upon a redeemer, Jesus Christ. And we also know that, that uh, this redeemer is revealed as Israel's, in the Old Testament, prophesied Messiah. And Paul talks about that. And although Israel as a whole has rejected Jesus as their Messiah. What we learn in chapter 11 is that God hasn't rejected Israel. He's, he's not through with Israel. And I take heart because in amazing, 1948, and even today, there they are in their land, in their nation. It's amazing. And so we're assured in Romans 11 that in the future, a remnant of Israel will be saved. And so if you run that out and you read the book of the Revelation, you find that's going to be, that's exactly there. Israel's blindness, that he calls it, concerning the Messiah, meanwhile, has opened the door for the Gentiles. You know, the church is the bride of Christ. Well, guess what? It's, it's pretty much Gentile. You see that whole progression and swing uh, in the book of Acts, pivoting in chapter 15. And so the door is open for Gentiles, by the way, who have believed in and received the Messiah. Jesus as the Messiah. And he describes us as a wild <laughs> olive branch. It's a marvelous thing. It's just a big panoramic view of God's purpose. And the Gentiles have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ, acknowledging him as the Messiah. Well, humbled by this great panoramic overview, God's redemptive plan, God's re redemptive purpose it, it, that, that reaches beyond even our generation. You think about that, we're 21st century. It, it reaches beyond us, okay? Paul, who regarded himself as the apostle of the Gentiles, was overwhelmed overwhelmed at what God laid. We see the same parallel in the book of Daniel. When, 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 when God comes to Daniel and relieves, gives him this great, uh, great purpose, you know, this great panoramic view of, 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 of history, prophetic history, it just, I mean, it leaves Daniel weak. Well, uh, Paul, seeing all this, is overwhelmed at God's knowledge, at God's power, and at God's wisdom, you see. And notice verse 33. 33 through 35 of Romans 11. Here Paul bows before God. What else could he do? In reverence, in worship, and this is what he confesses. Oh, the depth 
But the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgment and His ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been His counselor? Who hath first given to Him? And He will recompense unto Him again. So as 20, 21st century Christians, we can easily lose sight of the big picture which is largely unknown to us, but hallelujah, known to God. Okay? And our God, we concur with Paul, is so great and so powerful. Now think about this, that he can and he does. He still does. If you know your Bible, use the most unlikely people to advance his cause and purpose. Pharaoh with the dream of the seven years drought. I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar, right? He can use anyone, any person, any nation. Oh, and by the way, any event as a pawn and a catalyst to advance his own plan and purpose in human history. You say, well, Pastor, you mean you think this pandemic somehow is part of God's plan? Absolutely. I want you to understand, God's all, always, always has another agenda. I mean, you see this and, and this purpose, but I tell you what, you could can, you can count on it, this pandemic. You say, well, how? I don't know. I'm not going to be foolish and claim to know that. But I tell you what, God uses a pandemic. He uses a fam- famine, as we know uh, with uh, Joseph. But then verse 36 of Romans 11. This is what really blessed my heart. After he worships the Lord, he says of this, for of him and through him and to him are all things. Wow. To him be glory forever. Amen. So well, what is Paul acknowledging here? Paul is acknowledging that God is sovereign. He's acknowledging that God is in control of human history. And when Paul says, for of him, right? Well, he's acknowledging God as the source of all things, including human history. Okay? And and you read that in the Bible. God will wake up somebody. He'll wake up a, a Persian king and give him a bad case of indigestion. So he'll read through the, so the, some of the histories and remember Mordecai. I mean, God is just God. For of him, you see, he, of him. So he's acknowledging the, that God is the source of all things. But then, what else does he say? And what? Through him. Paul's acknowledging God's power, his prerogative. Now listen, to use whatever means He chooses to advance his plan, his purpose in human history. I mean, you know, people are hammering our president that he didn't see this pandemic. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. We've written God out of our consciousness in America. So we expect perfection, God-like knowledge and behavior from mortal men. And you know what? No one has that. How could anyone see this coming? No one. And no one's to be criticized for not seeing it coming other than the ones that they know and not telling it, but that's another thing. So we can't expect out of men what we can only expect out of God. But I tell you what, God, it's through him. God can use whatever means he chooses to advance his plan and purpose in human history. And then he says, and to him, okay, are all things So he's acknowledging that God as the end and the goal of all human history. And he's the end and the goal uh, of all things. So God is walking and working among the nations of the world and to work out his purpose ultimately to his glory. He says, he concludes verse 36, to whom, look at that. The whom be glory forever. Amen. And so this means that we as Christians must rise above. 
the perspective of national or political loyalties and perspectives. We must rise above it. We get caught up in this tit for tat and this political thing is way down here. You understand? It's way down here. And God's ways are up here. And, and, and we can't always perceive them. Why? And, but God's got a purpose. And for that, we're encouraged. Now, what is true on a global or national level is also true in your life. If God is in control and orchestrating the events of this world, you can be sure he's ordering your life too. Romans 8, 11, 36 acknowledges that, as he says later, that, that, that uh, God is the author and the finisher of our faith, you know, through Christ, right? We could think about Philippians 1, 6. We, because God is in control and he is God, we can know that what he begins as his good work in us, he will continue it. Right? You know, look, get the, get the, there's a, I want you to get, get a line, a straight line of history, you know, going in a certain direction. We're about to go there. Of him, through him, to him. You understand? And so that's the world of history. And that's even our lives. He that hath begun will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, let's stop a minute. There are three different ways to perceive history. First, there are some who view history as linear. Now, Paul's perspective of history here in Romans 11 is what we might or some might call linear. Okay, A linear conception of history basically means that it's headed in a certain direction. And most of Western society has a linear view of history. And the reason for that is it is founded in Judeo-Christian uh, truth and perspective. That's the word of God. Now, Christians believe that human history had a specific beginning, right? His, as creation of, uh, you know, of God and is being directed through God to a specific goal, events, okay? A non-repetitive course toward a designed end. And that is to God, okay? So basically, uh, that is what we see in verse 36 of Romans 11. And often naturalists view history as linear. And naturalism is the idea that uh, that only natural laws and forces are in control here, not as opposed to as opposed to supernatural or spiritual laws or forces operating in the world. So they perceive history as a series of natural events, but what they're minus is an overarching narrative or purpose. And they just believe, yeah, it's linear, but everything just happens. And in the naturalist view, human history will end in, in, in that humans will perhaps eventually become extinct. In fact, uh, there are some naturalists who would even like that. Here's the second thing. There are some who view history as circular uh, or uh, cyclical. Okay, and, and prior to the Christian description of history, classical thought viewed history this way as a cyclical. A cyclical view is one in which historical events were repeated over and over by consecutive societies. So often pantheists view history this way. Um, pantheism is the belief or philosophy that all the forces of the universe are God. And so reincarnation is often taught side by side with pantheism. Reincarnation, then, is it, since we're reincarnated, okay, then we get multiple chances, right, to get it right, which leads us to becoming one in cosmic consciousness. And so this view sees history as this circles, this ongoing around and around, endless circles with no overall 
purpose. And then the process of birth and death and rebirth, the individual kind of evolves to a higher or a lower state. And just stop a minute. You can take all the religions of the world, and you can put them in one or two categories. Justification by works or justification by grace, faith, you know, by God's grace. And, you know, and so even in this pantheist view, it's really up to you and what you do to receive, to evolve to higher consciousness. Now, here's the third uh, view, and that is uh, there are some who view history as both linear and redemptive. This is so important. Linear and redemptive, you see. The Christian worldview sees God as sovereign and in control of the world and everything. And so God has a plan, and he's carrying it out. He created man to have fellowship with him. You know the story. You know the narrative. Man sinned. God will judge him for his sins. And yet God in his grace has provided a plan by which a man can be reconciled to him. And so God is totally in control, shaping world events. But at the same time, he allows men to make decisions which shape their own destinies and future. And in the end, you know what we have? In the end, it's not so much my story, and history's not your story. No, no, no. History is his story. It's God's story. And it's the narrative of redemption, creation, fall, restoration, redemption. And so that's the Christian view of history, which we already see in Romans 11. And especially capsuled in verse 36. Now, that brings us to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 28. And we ask our question, where's all this going? Where is history going? Well, in this chapter, uh, the Apostle Paul has been arguing that the main thing about the gospel is that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again according to the scriptures. And he cites as evidence the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ. And on one occasion Paul says uh, that Jesus Christ appeared to 500 of his followers after his resurrection. Yet, Paul recognizes that still, even though there's all of this evidence... And, and Jesus went, entered this 40-day uh, post-resurrection ministry and then ascended publicly back to heaven. Yet, Paul recognizes that there are people who were still refused to believe in the resurrection of the dead uh, for Christ or anyone for that matter, let alone Jesus. So if this were so, then Paul says, if there is no resurrection, if Christ has not risen, then what? Our faith is in vain. It, it nullifies. And by the way, the hope, the hope of our own resurrection, the hope the, uh, of, the, uh, of the resurrection of our loved ones, they have no hope for those who died in Christ. And so it's here in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians that Paul inserts an emphatic but, but, that contradicts all of those that deny the resurrection. It starts in verse 20. That's where we are. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But, emphatically, now is Christ risen from the dead. Notice, and become the first fruits of them that slept. So Jesus' bodily resurrection, what we're learning here, is it has far-reaching implications for each one of us and for really the whole realm, whole of creation. Jesus Christ is described, notice, as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in Christ. The first fruits. That's the, the very first ear of corn out of the field, you know, or a stalk of a piece of okra. Can we say amen for okra? The first fruits, the sheep of the harvest. 
and that was brought to the temple and then offered to God. Well, what, what does that say? It's a, it's a sign of the harvest to come, you see. The first fruits. I, I stop a minute. Jesus called Lazarus from the grave in Bethany before his own resurrection. But listen to me. Lazarus wasn't the first fruits. He was not. He, he, uh, they had a great meal after that. He and Jesus had the same table. And boy, Lazarus was a great witness. He said many came to him because of Lazarus. But you know what? Lazarus had to die again. No, no. Jesus is the alone the first fruits, okay? He is the first fruits. A sign of a harvest to come. Now, what was true of Jesus Christ is going to be true of all believers who follow him in faith. I had a conversation with, uh, with, uh, with uh, William and, and Judith about Mary Jane Adams. You know what? She's gone, but we know where she is. I mean, it was a conversation full of hope, you know, expectation of seeing, of, of seeing Mary Jane again. That's what I'm talking about. Jesus is the forerunner of all of those who have died in Christ and will yet die in the future. And so Jesus' resurrection, he's the first fruits, he's the pledge, he's the guarantee, he's the proof of the resurrection, hallelujah, of all who die in the faith in Jesus Christ. I got a first cousin in Odessa, Ernest, who lost his sister during this uh, COVID-19. She didn't die with that, but she was in Oklahoma, and not even her husband could be with her. And that's tough. But I tell you what, I can tell you about Eva Lee. She knew the Lord. And she has hope because we have hope because of the first fruits. Verses 21 through 22. Notice of 1 Corinthians 15. For since by man came death, and by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So just as death came to humanity through Adam, so the resurrection from the dead shall come to all who are in the second or last Adam, Jesus Christ. All human beings face the reality of death in their lives and those of their loved ones, both physical mortality and spiritual death deadness or estranged from God. The problem of all humanity is that we live in a state of separation from God. Romans 6 23 says for the wages of sin is death but through faith and this is wonderful to know through the risen Christ we can be born again into a life that knows no enduring death but instead eternal life. Eternal life. Notice verse 23. But every man in his own order. Interesting. The Greek word translated uh, order here. It means something orderly or in arrangement. And it was merely a military term. It's talking about a regiment of soldiers. You know? The ultimate of order. Well, that word order here is applied to an order of events. Le uh, uh, leading to the culmination of of God's eternal plan. Now, we saw that plan in Romans 11 somewhat, pictured as an olive tree. You know? Of him, through him, to him. Well, this is, want you, I want you to know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is like a, a, a flash, a gun, you know, that flashes up, sends a, a flare. You know? <laughs> See, let the games begin. Let, let the events begin. And we just celebrated Easter. And we know about the ascension. But, but these events, because he's the first fruits. Are y'all with me on this? It signals a series of events that will ultimately culminate in God's eternal plan being finished. Here's the first. Christ's own resurrection. We've just talked about it. Verse 23, Christ. Verse 23 continues. Christ the first fruits. Look at that phrase. Christ the first fruit. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruit. So Paul goes on to say that Jesus' resurrection as the first fruit enables this sequence of events in history. Jesus' resurrection is the guarantor 
of all that is yet to come into the future. Well, what else is there? here? Well, because of that, we have the second thing. The imminent rapture and resurrection of believers. Verse 33 continues, afterward. You see that? Christ the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So Paul moves from the near past to what he regarded as the imminent future. He wrote that at Jesus' coming, all who belong to Jesus Christ, and I'm talking about the living and dead believers that are in Christ, will be raised and made alive forever. That word coming, Paul is speaking of what is known as the parousia, which is a transliteration of the Greek coming. Coming, okay? Verse 24, Then cometh the end. Okay? Then cometh the end. So we have Christ, the first fruits, guaranteeing of our future resurrection translation. You know? And then comes the end. Apostle Paul is telling us that our present age will come to an end. You got to understand that. God bless America. But my citizenship is in heaven. My first loyalty is to my God. And this nation will be go the way of all nations. You understand that? And so then comes the end. And so at, at that stage, Jesus will accomplish two more specific tasks uh, for the redemption of the universe. Here's the third one. Jesus hands over the kingdom to the Father. So Christ comes back. We have the rapture translation. We have the second coming to the, to the earth. We see the tribulation period, the establishment of his kingdom. And then we see God ultimately where he hands over his kingdom to God the Father. Notice verse 24 continues. When he shall have, Jesus, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. And so this event refers to Jesus' rule over the universe or of all, or all creation. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 27, we'll get down to it. It's going to give us more information about this event. Then comes the fourth event. Jesus' reign will include the abolishment of all other rule, authority, and power. Verse 24 concludes, Then he shall have put down all rule, all authority, and power. Okay? One day, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what he's talking about. I mean, this is ahead of us because of the first fruits because of our own resurrection, because of the righteous reign of Christ that shall be delivered back to the Father, that will involve Christ having abolished all other rule. On the cross, Jesus defeated the powers of darkness who are the enemies of God, who are the enemies of His people, all of which will be destroyed along with their power to afflict God's people. Verse 25. For he, Jesus, must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Wow. And that's an Old Testament idiom of the complete victory. Absolute victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see this in various places. Chapter uh, Psalm 8 verse 6 reads, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So in the Old Testament, the enemies were the unseen pagan nations, but in the New Testament, they are the angelic spiritual powers that are hostile to God and to his Christ. Paul says in that great warfare chapter, Ephesians chapter 6, for we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood, right? Against, but against powers, principalities, right? Wickedness in high places. I mean, and by the way, these evil spiritual powers influence humans and nations to disbelieve 
and rebellion. I mean, ultimately, Jesus will gain control and complete triumph over all his enemies. And then here's the number five. These aren't numbered in there, but I've numbered them for myself. And this is my favorite. I, I, you know, I, I preside over a lot of funerals, and I attend a lot of funerals, but I cannot wait to attend the funeral of death. The death of death. The annihilation of death. Verse 26. The last enemy. Don't you love this? That shall be destroyed is death. And that word destroyed there means to be made null and void. Death will be defeated and its curse will be removed. Verse 27. Paul picks up at the topic of Christ surrendering the kingdom to God the Father. And it reads, For he hath put, or he, God the Father, hath put all things under his Christ's feet. But when he hath saith all things are put under him, it is manifest, or in the King James, this is kind of muddled and clouded, it is obvious that he, God the Father, is exempt. I mean, God's not going to be put under God, Christ's feet, uh, except for the, so he is exe- uh, accepted or exempted, which did put all things under him, Jesus. So God the Father has given Jesus, God the Son, ultimate sovereignty over all creation. Jesus Christ has died for all people. He was risen from the dead. He'll return. He'll subdue his enemies. And the, at the climax of Jesus' work uh, will come the time when he offers up the kingdom to his Father as the source of all things. Now, stop a minute because I want you in your mind, and I'm, gonna, I'm drilling this in, but... Romans eleven thirty six, for of him and through him and what? To him are all things. Our conquering Savior, the captain of our salvation, all enemies were put under his feet. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. And the time will come when God the Son will offer the kingdom back to his And that's the culmination because that's the sixth thing. God's eternal purpose will be accomplished. Verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject to God and put all things under him. Notice how this ends. That God may be what? All in all. From him. Through him. To him. The idea of Jesus handing over the kingdom to God, submitting himself to him. Some cults suggest that the members of the Trinity aren't exactly uh, equal. That one is inferior to the other. That they're not co-equal. Paul, however, isn't speaking of the essential nature of either... or. Uh, of God the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. He's speaking of the work that's been accomplished by each member of the Trinity. The great, the great work of redemption is the work of the Godhead. They all had their role. And, and to me, this is wonderful because they all had a part and a place. And without all three working together, our redemption would have never happened. And now at its culmination, they're honoring the Father, okay? That he may be all in all. Simply means when all is done, God will reign over every dimension of creation in in every way. And he'll do it forever. So what's ahead? Where's this going? Well, be encouraged. This is where it's going. 
Hugh Prather said, My anxiety doesn't come in thinking about the future, but in wanting to control it. Well, you ought to be glad that you don't. Because you would mess it up. <laughs> like God is in control. Amen. So notice, when we as Christians grow anxious about the future, we need to stop and remember who is in control and what our future entails. We're, we are only briefly passing through this world and the only thing we can take with us when we leave it is an account of how we have lived. Our response to the trials in this life will actually prove our faith in God. How wonderful it is to know that heaven will be filled with endless praise, everlasting joy, perfect peace, contentment without darkness, suffering, pain, or sorrow. I'd like to end. This came strong to my mind. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 to 13. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, that we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. And that's where we are right now. You know that. But here's the future. Here's what we do now. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul saw, and he worshiped. We need to be reminded that every day we're writing our own history. Knowing this, we must trust in God, and we must lift our heads and look for our glorious blessed hope that is in Christ our Savior. Be encouraged. God bless you.